But remember, Brother Jack's also going to be here. Okay. That's like Brother Jack right here, roughly. All right, you guys can start making your way to your seats. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us a day here to get together. We're going to go ahead and worship him in spirit and in truth. Song, spiritual song. All right, we're going to pull out our red hymn books. We're going to go to 218. 218 in the red hymn book.
218 in the red hymn books. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Amen. There's that word again. You won't find us. That word, right? You won't find it in those uh, new versions, huh? Days are filled with sorrow and cares, hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today, leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Trouble soul the Savior can take every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. 272. 272. When this lost world feels that earth tremble, they get scared. Amen. But when it happens, if you're a Christian, saved, washed in the blood, we got that solid foundation, so no fear comes. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, and his blood support me in the whelming flood. All around my soul gives way. He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Here we go. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then him here be found. In his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can I ask the church please to stand and go to 149. Oh, good to be saved. Good to be in church. Amen. 149. It's been, a, it's been a blessing to, to keep up with all the brothers and sisters on the on the WhatsApp. Um, 
just hearing all the all the things that they're going through, uh, some of them witnessing, and <laughs> sorry, some of them uh, witnessing to their family members, you know, uh, it's, it's been a blessing to hear just uh, just reading reading about all that, and, and you know, um, it's going to be worth it all, you know, yeah. it'll, it'll all be worth it. Amen. All right. Here we go. Oft times the day seems long, our trials hurt to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair, but Christ will soon appear. Church, good singing. Uh, I'll ask uh, Brother Max to open the service with a word of prayer. Yeah. Oh God, bless this great man, Lord, so holy, so good. 
Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Let's go ahead and go to White Hymn Books. White Hymn Books and go to number 33. White Hymn Books number 33. Amen. All right. Number 33. Number 33 in the White Hymn Books. Can't wait till all this is over. You know, just to, just to um, even have just more singing. More singing, you know. All right, praise the Lord. Yeah. 
Hey, man. That's uh, Brother Sean to come up and do the announcements. Good to be saved. Amen. Amen. It is good to be saved, Brother Randall. Amen. It's good to be back in church. Amen. Yeah. Amen, brother. I feel like I need to I need like to hit the gym for my vocals again. <laughs> it's been so long since we've been singing and shouting at church. It's, it's such a blessing. It's so great to see everybody here. And yeah, I already told Pastor I'm gonna I'm gonna hang up here a long time today because I get to have that mask off so I can breathe. Amen. <laughs> it feels good. No, I'm kidding, Pastor. Kidding. I'm going. All uh, right, yeah, we have a lot of announcements today. We have like two months worth of announcements. So um, I'm going to send out also when I'm done with this on the WhatsApp. But please try to, if you have to take notes, uh, put it down in your phone, whatever you got to do. Uh, we got a lot of announcements to get through today. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and get going on this. Um, so, yeah, we want to respect the guidelines right now. No touching. I know you all want to hug each other, high five, you know. I'm not calling anyone out, but <laughs> I was kidding. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, no holy kisses, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're memorizing Romans 14, not 16, so we should be good. Yeah, so no touching, maintain that six. You know what, I'm, I'm tired of six feet. Make it seven feet. Let's, let's do a godly number for once, amen? Keep seven feet of distance, all right? Um, the mask. The masks, look, obviously we know these are not, you know, ideal. It's kind of hard to breathe, a little harder to sing, but, um, you know, it's not, it's not enjoyable for any of us, and hopefully it'll be uh, very temporary, but this is just what we had to do for, you know, the SES Hall to feel comfortable um, allowing us to have church, and, and God bless them, you know, praise the Lord for, for the fact that they would even feel comfortable enough yeah. us being back in church at all. So we want to we have a good testimony with them. And we want to always do what's right, amen? amen. So uh, hopefully, you know, as things progress, these guidelines will get lifted. We won't have to be wearing the mask any longer. But until then, let's just keep doing the right thing, amen? amen. All right, so uh, as far as the service schedule is going to go, um, again, please continue to monitor your emails and the WhatsApp for any changes. But as of right now, as it stands right now, we are going to have uh, Wednesday Bible study. Uh, like we've been doing, and it's going to be 7 p.m. is discipleship. So that's the same that we've been having so uh, for a while now. 7 p.m. discipleship, 8.15 is Bible study. And for anyone that's planning on coming next Wednesday, especially this upcoming Wednesday, okay, SES is going to be having a meeting, so we want to be keep quiet, okay? We want to be respectful. We don't want to be a disturbance to them at all. So do your best to, if, if you're going to come this next Wednesday, be quiet, okay? We want to be respectful of them and the meeting that they're having. Um, okay, now Sunday, next Sunday, um, there were some questions before about if we were going to be able to continue to have church the following weeks in this location. Uh, praise the Lord, as it stands right now, we are going to be able to continue to have church. So um, next Sunday, it's going to be the same as it was today. So the first service is going to be at 11 a.m., and it's going to end at 12.30. And Bible study is going to be uh, 12.30 to 1.30. So we're kind of going back to how we used to have it. We're not having lunch in between. We're not having any food or refreshments, anything like that. Um, so if you need refreshments or anything like that, please bring them for yourself. We're just going to go two services back to back, basically. And then you'll have the rest of your Sunday there. Um, that's another thing, hopefully, Lord willing, in the coming weeks or however long, we'll be able to have that fellow, that lunch fellowship in between services. But for now, we just got to do everything we can and be diligent in every way we can, okay? Um, weekly street preaching. Now, listen up for this because we got some changes. We are going to kind of be splitting up how we're doing uh, street preaching visitation. So weekly street preaching is going to be 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday. So it's going to be before Wednesday Bible study. And uh, I'm going to be out on that corner right there, that corner where the Jiffy Lube uh, and the, what is that, a Jack in the Box, I think, right there? Literally, what's that? Oh, is that where we're doing it, Pastor? Okay, okay, I'm sorry, forget what I said then. We're doing the normal street preaching spot 
of Andy's Barbecue. If anyone needs uh, directions on that, just let me know. But uh, for any of you who have been out street preaching before, I guess we're going to do the same spot as always. So that's going to be 5.30 on Wednesday. 5.30 on Wednesdays. And then for visitation, we're going to be doing weekly visitation as well. That's going to be on Saturdays at 11 a.m. with Brother Rob. So it's, gonna, it's not going to be Sunday. It's not going to be before church. It's going to be Saturdays, 11 a.m. with Brother Rob. And so for, uh, for the address or anything you might need for that, well, we'll get in touch with you or get in touch with Brother Rob if you plan on going, okay? Now, as far as the Zoom meetings go, and those have been such a blessing, amen? Those, amen. Have, amen. those have been such a blessing holding us over. Um, the youth group meeting and the ladies Zoom meeting will remain the same. Okay, so if you have any questions about that, if you want to get the invite, the, uh, the link for, for that group meeting, you'll go to Brother Rob for the youth group meeting, or you'll go to Brother Jared for the ladies uh, group meeting. Brother Jared is the one that handles the logistics for the Randalls for their meetings. So those two are going to uh, remain the same moving forward. And then just a quick additional note, today only ladies, please touch base with Sister Sheila after church for a real quick meeting. Uh, she would like to talk to you ladies, okay? So today after church, please meet up with Sister Sheila. Ladies. Um, okay, and then we will, uh, we're also going to consolidate our other Zoom meetings that we've been having to one weekly Zoom meeting that's going to be hosted by Brother Randall, okay? So if you uh, are not already aware of that, uh, if you would like to get in touch with Brother Jared, receive the links for those meetings. A lot of us who used to be group leaders on other uh, groups are just going to be, praise the Lord, we're, we just get to sit under some good teaching and good fellowship. And so we want to be an encouragement to Brother uh, Randall as well. The Randalls have been such a blessing to us. And those Zoom meetings, they've been ministering majorly. So uh, if you want to be a part of that as well, get in touch with Brother Jared. Uh, let me see here. Blowout fundraiser. Blowout fundraiser. How long has it been? We've gotten to uh, talk about that. But we are back in church. Praise the Lord. So I felt like a broken record before. You know, every week I would mention it. And now I'm like, praise the Lord. Blowout fundraiser. I get to mention it. So, um, yeah, blowout fundraiser. Keep that in mind and pray for it. I mean, it's not promised that we'll even be able to still have our blowout. You know, who knows what might happen. So pray for the pastors, everyone traveling. Pray for our church um, and pray for the blowout. And then uh, also, if you would like to give to the blowout onliners, it is open as well. So hopefully by now, the past couple months, you're aware of how to give if you would like to give. Um, so uh, you can go on our website. Also on our YouTube channel, I think there's like a yellow donate button somewhere. Just uh, find that, click that, and please specify that you would like uh, to give toward the blowout. And we'll make sure it gets there, all right? Now, let's quickly go over to Romans 14 for our memory verse. And praise the man, we were doing so, that was so fun. We were going through Romans 14, and it feels like a lifetime ago that we've been over there. But amen, it's a great, great chapter. And uh, a lot of this Romans 14 stuff is especially needed in this time, amen? <laughs> amen, amen. So let's see what we have today, all right? So Romans chapter 14, and we're going to be going through uh, verses 12 to 14. Romans chapter 14, verse 12, the Bible says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not, therefore, judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So do your best to uh, do your best to memorize those verses there. I mean, Romans 14, maybe as a refresher, just read Romans 14 again. You know, there's a lot of judgment going uh, back and forth between different churches, different pastors, different groups right now. And one thing that you should keep in mind is that every one of us is going to give an account of ourselves. 
to God. Every knee will bow and tongue confess. So now is the time, hopefully, that when we've been having this isolation where you've <clears throat> had a time to look inward. You're not looking at everyone else so much, but you're spending some time alone with God and you're trying to get some things right before you will have to give an account to God. Amen? So do your best to memorize those verses over the course of this next week. And without further ado, uh, our special today will be Sister Joyce. Sister Joyce, come forward, lift them up, sister. to take up the Lord's offering. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Brother Max to come forward as well as Brother Daniel, Brother Max and Brother Daniel to come forward and to take up the Lord's offering for us. If you would uh, recall, uh, please make sure that you do not uh, touch the plate. Just put the money over there and let the usher come to you, all right? So ushers, make sure that you reach out everybody. That way they don't have to uh, stretch out and reach you. 
the way that we set up the room is a little different so brother brett might be playing two verses i don't know you know there's a lot, a lot, a lot more running around to do over here with this uh distancing thank you so much for coming to church uh just a few more other announcements i just want to add is that uh, the korean zoom meeting is continuing so i just want to let everybody know about that too the korean zoom meeting is still continuing um, if there's any confusion about uh, are we having Zoom meeting, just know this. No, it's done. The only exceptions, the only exceptions are the ladies Zoom meeting, the Korean Zoom meeting, and the youth Zoom meeting led by Brother Robert and the Zoom meeting led by Brother Randall. All right, if any of you are interested in still maintaining Zoom, then you join Brother Randall's Zoom meeting, okay? Uh, Brother Jared will be the one to set up the logistics. So if any of you have questions, you contact Jared. If you do not have his number, you can ask uh, Sister Sheila, Brother Randall, or me, or any of us. I'm sure some of us has Brother Jared's number. He's not such a total stranger that, uh, hey, we don't know you, brother. So, <laughs> so I'm sure one of us will be able to help you. For those online who are curious about sending offering, you can mail to us at San Jose Bible Baptist Church, P.O. Box 97, Santa Clara, California, 95050. You can mail it there or go to our website, bbcenglish.org. If you go over there, front page will show the donation button. If you click on that one, you can find our ministry to support. Thank you so much for your patience. I had to get it all out there. That way everyone understood. All right, I would like to ask Brother Daniel to open up the offering with a word of prayer, please. Lord, thank you for bringing us here on this Sunday. Good to be back in church. It's been a very long time. We feel like the whole world needs uh, this gathering to take place. Hopefully soon all churches across the, the United States will be able to reopen so that we can begin praising you again in a, in a large group. Mm -hmm. I just want it to happen. Amen, that's good. Uh, Lord, please lay your hand over this whole country as there is bad things happening as far as oh, God. the this mass chaos is, yes. is the ensuing right now. We need your, your hand Protect to us, the Lord. nation and to, to heal us. Um, and lastly, I want to pray for the return of King Kong. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We know that that's ultimately the, the, the destination. That, that's the part where we get to go back to heaven with King Jesus where it needs to be. Amen. 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 All right, please open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming to church today. I hope that the Lord will speak upon your hearts through this message. I had a very difficult time, to be honest, to come up with a sermon for you today. But the Lord finally laid upon my heart to preach this particular message. You know, I don't know, to be quite honest... Uh, I don't think that really this sermon is something that's new that you're going to hear. It's pretty much a fresh review of everything that you've heard in my previous coronavirus sermons. I feel like it's a culmination. But the Lord laid it upon my heart to preach this message because I feel like that everything that we've gone through, that this particular situation the Lord put us through, I don't want it to be in vain. I want it to be something where we can take as valuable lessons where we can change our life. So whether it convicts you or not in this message, uh, I am not aiming to do that. Uh, I just felt led of the Holy Ghost to preach this message, and I'm going to do what the Lord laid upon my heart to preach. It's as simple as that. It doesn't have to be something special or dramatic. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, and then we'll read verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 
wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though ye in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. This has been one of the most famous passages concerning about Christian trials that we go through in life. And the Bible says that trials are deliberately intended where God's children can be honed and fashioned to better purposes. I have a strong conviction and a belief and I have a good feeling that every one of you believes this too. That this coronavirus, we know that that's the hand of God. That he allowed everything for a reason. And the Lord allowed situations like this to happen so that we can take something from it. So that we can learn and apply it in our lives. Why? So that we can give him greater glory. Because our life's purpose is to... Give him greater glory, is it not? That's all our heart, breath, and being is to hit, give him greater glory. And I hope that this sermon will help you today to review some of the things, some of the takeaways from the coronavirus and your pastor. And when I say your pastor, I'm talking to the people in my church, obviously. I want you to understand that some of the takeaways that I've gotten perhaps might apply to you in some way. These points have applied to me that I've took in my life and perhaps might apply to you in your life in some way. The title of my message today is What Happens to Christians After the Coronavirus? What Happens to Christians After the Coronavirus? Let's pray. Father God, I am nothing. And please wash away my sins with your blood and fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit, God, every time I preach. I am helpless and I cannot preach well. So you need to guide me. You need to anoint my tongue and my very being so that the very essence that comes out is purely the word of God and nothing of flesh, nothing of self. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll use me today where, Heavenly Father, you know, you know which people could need this message. I feel like that this sermon is just a fresh review so maybe it's something that we all just naturally know, but perhaps there are some people that need to be reminded. Or some of these things might be new to someone. So I pray, Heavenly Father, that whatever be the case, that you will guide this message and use it for your greater honor and glory. I mean, it's nothing special, nothing dramatic. It's just pretty much practical, Father. I'm just going to preach what you want me to preach. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so here are some practical things that I've taken and a lot of the things may just be repetition, but the Lord knows. The Lord knows that it might help you or somebody over here. You never know. One, the first thing is concerning temptations. Temptations. Now, during the coronavirus situation, I noticed that what it did is that it can also open up a greater opportunity for temptation and sin. A lot of times it can help isolate us from a lot of the temptations out in the world, but when you're in isolation in your home, it also brings greater opportunity for temptation. So it just works both ways. Sometimes it closes uh, the opportunity for temptation, but it also opens the door simultaneously to other things in life. So I've noticed that in my life and in pastoring the church that temptations has opened up more often during isolation. You might say, why? Because during that time of isolation, you're at the tendency of just being still. And when you're at a point of being still, it opens up greater doors of temptation to seep in. Because you're at the convenience of your home, you're frustrated, you're stressed out that you cannot have access to the outside world. And that you're stressed out concerning financial situation, your family situation, job situation, and the church situation, and your future. So temptation actually comes in more easily when there are greater stressors. When stressors seep in, then what happens is temptations seep even more easily 
concerning about the addictions that you struggled with, the lusts that you struggled with, the bad habits that you struggled with, depression, misery, fear, and etc. And all these things provide greater open door and opportunity because of the stressors that happened, and not only that, during the privacy and the convenience in your own home. Because you're not in church where brethren and the preaching of the word of God or the pastor can keep tabs on you. You had 24-7 in the convenience of your home where there's greater opportunity and temptation for the devil to whisper in your ear. So during the coronavirus situation, I wondered if some of you have learned valuable lessons on how to conquer temptations. If you recall in some of the messages that I preach, I gave you some keys on how to conquer temptation and warning about temptations during this COVID-19 situation. So did you thought about the stressors that were involved? See, stressors are usually the open door, and if you don't think so, then what you need to do is that you need to, in, during this entire sermon, I'm going to have to ask you to use your thinking caps a lot. <laughs> I know we're tired, we're happy to be back in church, but just use your brain power a little, bit, little more throughout this message. I'd appreciate it. Because I want you to stop and think about yourself. Because perhaps during this whole time you didn't stop to think. Stop and think about yourself that, okay, what kind of temptations have you struggled with during COVID-19? I know that Netflix have been emptied out because so many people are using it. The internet was pretty much crashing because so many people using it. Video games, social networks, chats, YouTube videos, etc., etc., Instagram posting, Facebook, etc., etc. All these kind of things, you got to think about what kind of temptations have been building up more often. And when you think about that, perhaps it's none of the things I mentioned, but it's other things that you know that we don't know about. And only God and the devil know. What kind of temptations have you struggled with during this COVID-19? And then if you know what they are, then ask what caused it. Was there, were there stressors involved during COVID-19 that caused it? We don't think about that. All we think about is in the middle of temptation is we're living in this pressure and stress that I can't help it. I can't help it and that's why I got to do it. Why? Because we're in the moment of feeling, not in thinking. And the, that's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. That's why Galatians 5 warned us to walk in the spirit that what? You might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You got to let the Holy Spirit convict you, work in your mind. But we're not going by the moving of the Holy Spirit. We're just going by feeling. We're not thinking. Usually one thing I notice that helped me so often during temptation is, okay, you're going to commit that temptation since stop for a moment and think. If your flesh wants to fall into the fear, the depression, whatever addiction and lust or whatever sin that you go through, the best advice, uh, the best thing that I can say is this, is that if it turns out that you're at that dangerous situation that you're about to fall, then do this one thing. Make a promise. Make a promise that you'll do this one thing before you do the sin. See, we're going through this stress of don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, and then that just builds up greater urge and temptation to sin, actually. Because the flesh, the tendency rises higher when there's a spiritual conflict that says no. You ever seen children? When you say no, what do children do? They'll do it. <laughs> When you say no to them, it encourages them. Why? Because that's our human nature. Our human nature is when there's a resistance or a negative thing or a no, it builds up greater urge and temptation. So, so we going through this motion, don't sin, don't sin, and then we go through the pressure and then it just wants to sin. So before you commit the sin, just tell yourself this way. Okay, you're going to mess up, you're going to fall into sin, but do this one thing before you do it. And that is pray to the Lord. And just pray to the Lord and be very specific too. Don't just pray, Lord, deliver me from this. No, just pray specifically. Lord, I'm struggling with this sin. And God's like, okay, what is it? Tell me. 
And you're like, oh, God, you know. And God's like, well, probably you don't know, so you need to tell me. And then you start telling the Lord, and then you realize the more specific you are in your prayer, in telling him the temptation that you struggle with, the more you recognize the stressors, the origin of the sin that were involved. And when you realize that, the more that you pray, the more the Holy Spirit reveals you things. And then when you start doing that, your mind finally starts thinking about the stressors and the sins involved. And not only that, if you want to go by feelings of the flesh, why don't you go, if you truly have that feeling, why don't you pour that feeling to the Lord instead, huh? Rather than feeding to your flesh, why don't you pour it to the Lord and say, Lord, this is, and I do that too. I do, what I do is that I imagine the very thing, the, the sin that I'm about to do. I like imagine myself in that situation. I say, Lord, here is what my brain and my mind can picture what I'm about to do. I covered it underneath the blood of Jesus. And then I just pray, and then I imagine that blood flowing. And then I ponder on that blood a little longer. And then when I look at, when I see the blood, then I see the face of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And looking at me and saying, are you crucifying me again? Just keep picturing that and then just keep pleading the blood. And then not only do I, would I picture it, I would give him my emotion how I would feel. I would say, this is how I exactly feel. The very urge in, in my blood, my veins, and my bones, in my body. Just, this is the feeling. I surrender it to the blood. And as that song goes, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Yeah. Cover it underneath the blood. It's under the blood. It's under the blood, as one song goes. Surrender that to the Lord. And once you do that, then what happens is, then the Lord, you'd be surprised how many times he'll give you victory. And then during the times when you fall into some temptation and sin, you'll know what the origin, the sources of those sins are. And once you know them, then you can start clearing those sources. Why? If you clear up the origin of the source of sin, then maybe the temptation would not have started. Maybe if Eve distanced herself and didn't look at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, she probably would not have sawn the serpent. And the serpent wouldn't have a chance to talk to her, perhaps. Think about it. So just think about what were the stressors, the original stressors that were involved that caused you to sin? Was it because you haven't gone out as much? Was it because you weren't reading the Bible and praying first thing in the morning like you were supposed to? And you'd be surprised if you do that first thing in the morning how much it would help you. Amen. And I mean first thing in the morning. Amen, because the first thing that our flesh tends to do in the morning is what our flesh wants to do. And if that's the very feeling and the very thinking that you started out in the morning, it will dictate the rest of your day by going by how I, my flesh wants to feel, my flesh wants to think. But if you start out your day where you go by what the Holy Spirit wants, Bible reading and prayer, then the rest of your day you'd be surprised how much it can dictate you on going by the Holy Spirit. For example, you ever thought about that Bible reading was so hard, but once you started reading one chapter, then the tendency grew to two chapters and three chapters, four chapters after that? Did that ever happen to you? Did it ever happen to you before when you were just praying for just three minutes on your knees, seriously and specifically, and then all of a sudden the three minutes grew to six minutes, and then nine minutes, 12 minutes, 20 and 30, etc.? See, so that's why... Think about the temptations that were involved during this coronavirus situation. I'm surprised that all this came out of my mouth just now, actually. <laughs> I only just wrote the points. But, I'm trying, but you can tell that I'm trying to give you a lot of reflection of what I experienced during COVID-19. And maybe perhaps it can help somebody in this room. Another thing during this COVID-19 situations that happened to a lot of Christians is about the time that we have spent with God and the time we have spent with our family. So whether you're single and don't have a family or whether you do have a family, the point is that both people, that they have time spent with God. And then those of you with family, now you had more time spent with family. So perhaps during COVID-19, you had more time spent in the home with your family. More time in home with God. And I noticed during the coronavirus situation, it just opened up so much time and opportunity 
where there were some books that you wanted to read and grow in your spiritual knowledge, you finally start to read them. And then some of the uh, chapters in the Bible, you start to increase it. Because why? Because now you got more time in your hands. The prayer life became a little bit more different now. Why? Because you got more time in your hands. And then you don't have that, uh, that stupid phone ringing in your ears or you, people yelling at you at the workplace or the craziness and the silliness of traffic. And now we got the stupid riots going on of all things. Hopefully that will keep people inside the home and spend more time with God maybe. Yeah, that's and, then, and then we got, uh, you see every single day when you're going out in traffic, people cussing, take God's name in vain, the reek and the nasty smell of the city life and downtown. And then where there's drinking bars open and then the dance places open and et cetera, et cetera. All these things you're finally distanced from them. The busyness, the, the tremendous busyness of work life and being around people, now that's been changed and shifted where you're now spending time with family and with God. So because of that social distancing, now the only social life that you have is with God or with the people in your home. And because of that, it opened up greater opportunity to do that. Now, my question to you is that you had not just one week to do that, yeah. not just one chance to do that. You had multiple chances and not just three weeks to do it, not just one month and not just two months. But you had pretty much a whole season, if not longer, of so much opportunity to do it for the Lord. How come you didn't do it? Or did you do it? You know, uh, the discipleship videos I mention quite often to onliners and to people in this church is that that's a great chance if you're a baby Christian and you want to grow in the Lord, Amen. that's the time to knock off those discipleship videos now. Amen, and those are intended for new, uh, newcomer Christians. We all feel like that I come to Sunday and Wednesday, I know enough. No, you got to realize that a lot of the members here, they, they've already grown from the discipleship videos that I taught like eight years ago in this church. So the doctrines and the teachings that I'm now giving to the people is not accommodated to your level. It's not starting where your spiritual life is at. So now it was the time to spend time on discipleship videos. And this is especially to onliners. This was a chance where you can start uh, reviewing and learning how to do soul winning. I taught that online as well. There was so much opportunity now to memorize the Bible finally when you haven't been memorizing the Bible. Why? Because I'm too busy. Well, you're at home now. You got so much time spent with God now. Bible study, discipleship, Bible reading, prayer, memorizing scripture. Why? Because basically it's one thing. Social distance, when the world says that, that basically translates to social distance from the world. So now that you're separated from the world, you got so much of that time now where you can spend with the Lord God Almighty. What prevented you? What prevented you? Perhaps the first point is temptation, the feeling of the flesh. And that has to be conquered underneath the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You got to realize that with that, that much time in your hands, how was that created to begin with, right? How was it created to begin with where you can spend so much time with the Lord? And if some of you have spent more time with the Lord, did you notice there was a change in your spiritual life? I guarantee, I promise, I promise, and I guarantee you, there is a change in your spiritual life. You, you think that I need so much time in church where I can spiritually grow. That's true. That's the first thing that I would advise. But the only reason why I'd, I'd advise that is because I know how fleshly people are. That if they're isolated alone in their home, that the temp tendency is greater for the flesh so that church is that thing that kind of disciplines and forces that flesh to live spiritually that's the reason why I recommend church first of all but to be quite honest what's greater than church attendance and the most important thing in your life is your relationship with Jesus Christ but because we're so fleshly we don't have a tendency to do that see that's the reason why I mentioned about church, 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 coming to church as the first thing. Because I know how fleshly and weak we are. And a lot of us don't even know that either. That's one thing I realized and learned. 
But if you spend time with the Lord, relationship with Jesus Christ is as strong like you're supposed to, I guarantee there is a tr transformation in your spiritual life greater than just attending church, getting right with God, and then the very next Monday you go back to business again in your flesh, into the world. Spending time with God is more powerful and greater and a spiritual cleansing. And I guarantee there's a transformation in your life. Sometimes you'd be surprised that the same temptations that you have before is because your spiritual walk is not sincere. It's not right. A lot of times uh, if I were to counsel an addict or a person having uh, no victory in his or her life, you know what the first question that you might have to prepare to be asked is? How's your Bible reading life? How's your prayer life? And I don't mean just a traditional machine either. It's something that's sincere, very specific, that you're concentrating on the words and you're concentrating in prayer to the Lord where your heart is in it. I don't ask that, obviously, during counseling, so please don't get scared. You might say, why? Because I know how I would feel when somebody asked me that, right? But, you'd be, but that is the first question. You'd be surprised that you should ask yourself, and that can transform your life. But what prevented you? What prevented you? Oh, the first point, temptations. So go back over there and recall what the stressors were, how you can give victory over that, etc. And another thing is this, is that because you're distanced from the world, social distance, parentheses, from the world. That's what it is. That's why the more you're separated from worldly items and possessions, guarantee you have more time in your hands for the Lord. You know, um, why haven't you done Bible reading and prayer? So think about the source then, huh? What, what was it? I'm busy? I got to take care of my family? I got bills to pay? Well, now think about this. What if those things were isolated, take taken away from you then? A lot of times you'd be surprised that the more that we have to have things, the more it will keep us away from peace and from our relationship with God guarantee but the more that you forcibly separate yourself you'd be surprised the more time that naturally happened and is given to you to spend time with God you got to force that out of your life you got to force that out of your life that's why Paul mentioned about I mean Paul went so far as to mention at 1 Corinthians 7 that it is better for people to be single. Why? Because when you're in a family, you have to be bound by taking care of husband or wife or children. And then uh, the children are occupied with parents, etc., etc. So because you're bound by that, why? Because 24-7, you're taking care of a crying baby, right? If not, then your spouse has been a crying baby large enough too. <laughs> I'm sure some women can nod their heads and some of the guys too privately, but they won't do that in front of their wives. <laughs> but the thing is, joking aside, yeah, my time will come. I'm being single, so I'm just enjoying saying that, I guess. My time will come, right? And then you're all going to nod your heads and go, ah, 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 like that to me too. My time will come one day. But uh, aside from joking, the point is this, is that the point is, see, when you, when you realize that, we don't think that the world, we think that the world that has around us, we're not thinking like it's a temptation or it's a sin, see. We think it's a natural part of our life. It's something we have to have. And that's the greatest victory I think Satan has done is that something that he disguised something that was a tendency of the flesh, worldly and sinful with something that's natural. Something that's normal or has to be a part of our life. Perhaps if your excuse is with Bible reading and prayer, I'm just too busy, etc. Perhaps you have to detach from those things then. Why do you think even false religions recognize that like Buddhism and then Catholicism with isolation in monasteries? Why do you think even the devil's people know that? It's so that they can spend their own time in their own spirit world with their false God. But Christians can't do that with their relationship with Jesus Christ. Is spending that de is to detach, detach from things in this life. We take it normally, job, school, 
friendship. And by the way, this includes church too. Pastors think, yeah, pastors think that because church is a necessary thing for the work of the Lord, and not just pastors, I want to say every Bible-believing Christian, sometimes you confuse spiritual task. Spiritual tax. This is part of the ministry. This is necessary. This is something I have to do to serve the Lord. But that takes away your relationship with the Lord God. Didn't you know that even soul winning could perhaps take away your relationship from the Lord? I need to leave. Souls are dying and burning in hell, Pastor. And then God's like, don't you think I know that? What about time with me, child? What did he say to Judas? You always think the poor, but not about me. Don't, uh, you know what, why we, why our relationship with God is very weak? Because we justify it with the excuse of something natural in our worldly life. That's a part of our physical life, something natural, one. And it's not sinful, right? The second thing is we justify it with something spiritual. Don't you dare bring a spiritual excuse to justify something that you know what is right with the Lord. Because that's one of the most dangerous things to be in. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Because I know. Don't you think that this mind who, you know, teaches the Bible, preaches the Bible, understands that tendency, that sin of using spiritual justification? But when you, uh, when you uh, discard the spiritual justification and look at your own heart and say, God, sh show me what I'm supposed to do, what's right, you know what's right. You exactly know what's right. Mm -hmm. And that's just the flesh using a spiritual excuse. On, and isn't that one of the most wicked things to do is for the flesh to use something spiritual to justify your sin? And don't you think that would blaspheme the Lord? So detach yourself and you'd be surprised. By the way, let me say this to you. You'd be surprised that you might think that, well, it's because I'm weak. I'm fleshly. It's because of the first point, Pastor, temptations. That's why I'm not spending enough time with God. Then you'd be surprised that actually if you were to detach, if you were to practice detachment in your life from those worldly things, you'd be surprised how much of the temptations would not occur. Perhaps the source of taking away your relationship with God is not the temptation, but because of something you accepted as part of your life. Because think about it. Let's say that um, for an easy example. Okay, I can't do Bible and reading and prayer. Why? Because I'm weak. Well, maybe you're weak. Why? Because you're just so used to sitting down watching TV all day, yeah. watching stuff online, playing stuff online, doing chats online, right? Well, what if you were to practice detachment where cable is off, where the internet is now placed in the living room and everyone makes a rule, the family makes a rule, no more than 30 minutes, etc. Or maybe just unplug everything, right? <laughs> if you were to do that, all right, that's why your pastor never dared to touch PlayStation. You might say, why is that? I don't know what the latest game is, all right? Don't make fun of me, okay? But uh, why, why doesn't your pastor have that? The reason why I don't have that is because I know once I touch, I don't want to open up to something that's a dark hole that I can't turn back. So it's best I never touched it. I don't, I'm afraid to drink, actually. I am afraid, seriously. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Because once I put that in my mouth, I'm afraid there's no turning back. Worldly music, I am afraid to listen to it. Contemporary music, you might say, why? Because I know there's no turning back. How do you know that, Pastor? Because some members in my church know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And they told me the same thing. Yeah. There's no turning back. See, it's best to what? Detach. Amen, if you were to detach, you'd be surprised how many of the temptations would not even happen and how much natural your relationship with God would occur. The time is spent with family as well, right? Because of the distancing from the world. And a lot of times... A lot of the men, and this can include some women too, were so preoccupied with work. And because of that occupation with work and with people, it prevents us from spending time to what? To take care of my spouse and my children. You got to realize that, hey, you know, uh, I may not have a family, 
But I've taken care of families. I've seen families in my dad's church all my life. And then I've also, the Lord has shown me some things in the scripture concerning family as well. And perhaps some of the things that I say, you might even agree with me, which might validate what I'm going to say over here. But the thing is, is that when you're so preoccupied with the work and the busyness, and what, what is that? That is an excuse again, right? Either a spiritual justification or a natural, non-sinful justification that's part of physical life. And we use this where I can't keep track of my children. They're your children. Why do you complain about the next generation getting worse if you can't take care of your generation? You know why you're, you couldn't take care of your generation? Simple. The reason why is your older generation did the same mistake like you had the same excuses like you. It was either a spiritual justification or a natural, non-sinful justification. And that's the reason why you failed your children. You failed your children. But it's so difficult. Well, hey, let me tell you what. My, my father, I mean, he worked so hard to get a graduate degree. He had six figure. He, he was going to have it made. My mom and dad were planning to put me and my brother in Harvard. Look what happened. <laughs> it didn't happen. But the thing is, it's like, hey, we planned this out. All the relatives, family members, and friends, they were excited. Not only that, they were faithful in church too. So they had all the spiritual excuses and physical, natural, non-sinful excuses. But my dad had to reject everything by faith and say, hey, we're just going to California. And my mom's like, no, I don't want to go to California. <laughs> You know why? Who loves California? Now, hey, no offense, all right? Please do not stone me to death, Californians, okay? But California, man, I mean, the environment is sinful. The opportunity is just messed up. It's more liberal-minded. I mean, I'm sorry, okay? So in California, we were at that spiritual haven, so to speak. See that? Where it was more convenient and easier to serve God. And then not only that, my, um, my family raised me in homeschool life all my life, actually. And all these things that they had it all made and planned and they worked so hard with sweat and tears, they threw it away. They threw it away. My mom and dad surrendered their life to God and just went out by faith and say, Lord, we just give it all up. And then we start from scratch. And they went to an apartment that had no air conditioning and a, they drove a car that was older than me. And that was how they started. And then for six months straight, my dad had to uh, pastor a grandmother and another member. That's it. Just a person who hardly went to church and then a grandmother went like that. But because of that, why do you think then his spiritual life is strong in the Lord? My mom's spiritual life is strong in the Lord. Not only that, their children or this son or this person over here was able to pastor a church in one of the most liberal places in the world. You know who takes care of the family? God. Amen. Not you. Amen, God. I thank God that my family gave up everything. So that, why? I can be here today. Do I regret? Do I get angry about what my life could have been? And what my parents could have given me? Not at all. You know why? Because my heart is settled on God, not on the world. <laughs> and that's the greatest gift that my parents ever given to me. I can't thank God enough for that. Because there are so many children like me who didn't have good parents. Who sought the world and prosperity. And now the children, they're trying to lead their parents to salvation. A lot of people envy me. You know why? Because I had it made. And that's why family, time spent with family, you have that much time now. Don't waste it. Use it. Use it for your children's sake. Use it for your marriage's sake. Sometimes, husbands, you don't know what your wives are going through and they can need that more, that closure time. Why? Because being a Bible-believing Christian life is hard enough. And you're probably their only consolation that can comfort them, that can strengthen them, that can lead them. They need your leadership. They need that leadership where they can feel they can depend on you, where they can feel like all the emotions, the pain and the struggles, even sins or things that people would judge them for, they can rely on you on. And husband and wives, you'd be surprised how much that your husbands, what kind of pressure and stress that they're going through that you don't know about. They need your support. More than ever. They need your support. They need your prayers. They need your love and care. 
nothing greater than a mother's touch. Two things in my family was my mother's love and my father's leadership. Those two things got me to where I am. Time spent with family. Children, you got parents. And all that time now is spent with your parents rather than with the people in schools. Because the time that you spend with people in school, it changes your thinking. It changes your culture. And then you think that what mom and dad says to you is weird, and what they instruct to you is weird, and it's not normal, it's not cool. Why? Because you're, stu you're stuck with the worldly environment of your friends, and you want to look cool to them. You want to assimilate to their environment. But now time spent with family isolated you from that mess. Trust me, if there's a generation you don't want to assimilate yourself to, you want to normalize yourself to, is your generation. Children, it's best to be away from that world. Why? So that you don't get tempted by the world. You don't think that this is normal for me to do things like they do. That's why parents are always boggled. Why can't my children understand the preaching and the teaching when I bring them to church? You know why? School had a greater grip than the church. That's why detachment is probably one of the best things that happen in my life. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, there's plenty of Bible-believing children that went to schools and, yeah, even public schools. Hey, I went to Berkeley too, all right? So I get that. But the thing is this, is that the children were grounded very strong. And the children I'm talking about is people in my dad's church. A lot of them went to prestigious universities and UCs, actually. USC, UCLA, et cetera, et cetera. But these children and the people who probably are witnesses are the people who visited my dad's church. Very good children. But you know why? They had a strong family foundation. A family who believed in bringing their children to church no matter what. A family who believed in making sure that they keep guarding their children no matter what. Not just dumping them to a nursery worker or to some family member to take care of them who's not as spiritually strong as you. You know who they need? They need mommy, they need daddy. That's what they need. And yeah, they may be 15, 16, 17, and they might not call you mommy, daddy anymore, but trust me, inside they are. They're still children. They're still children who need guidance. And they need the parental support too where it's not just parents just bashing them either. Because parents keep bashing them, they feel like a child, and that's why they seek solace to their wife. Dad, the reason why you need to spend time with your children is because they need that greater love and appreciation with you, not with their friends. Be close. Be close with them. You know, one of the people that I fight, perhaps fight the most is with my dad, but the person that I talk to the most is perhaps my dad too. You know Why? Because he raised me, and I was close, and he did not give up on me, no matter how much my, in my human nature or things that I'd done in my flesh rebelled and wanted to do things that were sinful and wrong. I didn't. Why? Because I had a family who kept track of me, who cared for me. And, children, and parents, they need, your children need you to keep track of them but in a way also where you're not controlling and demanding of their lives, but rather, I'm doing this because I love you, because I support you. Think of something else, because there's so much opportunity in the world that the children think is fun to them. So think of ways where you can spend time with your children, where they can seek solace and pleasure and fun. Wouldn't it be great if they found fun in soul winning, in church, in hymn singing? And they find more pleasure and joy in hymns rather than CCM and Taylor Swift, of all things. I mean, why is it your children have a worldly appreciation than a spiritual appreciation? You don't probably show them the spiritual appreciation. Show them your love, your passion for the Lord, and it will infect your children. Another thing during this... Uh, coronavirus situation i'm very surprised how much time i spend talking about those things so i had a uh, i had like uh eight points actually and i only went through two but what i will do is that i'll just simply uh glance through these skim through these and also skip some of them and then come to the last point i'm almost done but during this coronavirus situation what also helped us 
was concerning about our faith, right? We've learned more to trust and obey rather than leaning upon the news, leaning upon the government, yeah. leaning upon our money, our job, our situation, yeah, you, and the church and family. We've relied more on God. And when we rely more on God, the prayer increases. The prayer becomes more passionate. The prayer becomes more specific and even habitual. That's what prayer does. You know, I can guarantee, I guarantee you this, that because of this coronavirus situation, my faith increased a lot more. How about you? Did your faith increase or was it a waste of time? Did you learn a lot? Did your faith increase a lot during this coronavirus situation? I know it did for me. I know that uh, a lot of you might recall, like, at the very day when they were, like, doing lockdown, and I was, like, frantically calling everybody, right? <laughs> But during that time, I was very amazed how I was, like, uh, I was like thinking, I was calm, and I was knocking things off one by one. I know that if I went five years prior, I would have broken down. You might say, how were you able to be that controlled? Because God took me through too many crises in my life where I've learned he's always in control. So I know he's going to take care of our church. We're not going to die. I realize that. People are so worried about, hey, you know, what if they shut down churches? What if they force the vaccines? What if there come a time that the 666 bill just evolves into a different bill or it just goes to where they forcibly enter into your homes, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not worried. A lot of the things, I mean, that I uh, show about what our government is doing, yeah, I'm upset about the evil, but I'm not worried. I'm at peace. You know why? Because the Lord took me through many crises in my life. And 90% of what I'm worried about, you'd be surprised, didn't even happen. And what if the 90% of worry did happen? My peace is in Jesus Christ. The Lord, and the Lord promised he never given me a temptation greater than I can bear. And that's such a great promise that I was like, man, and the, the fear is gone. The worry is gone. The Lord took me through so much in my life. And I, that's what this COVID-19 situation did for you as well. Yeah. Increased your faith in the Lord and prayer. And if it didn't, now would be a good time. It increased your thankfulness and your joy. Yeah. The smallest things in life where we pray over our food before we eat it. Yeah. And then now, you know, using toilet paper of all things, you've learned to be, uh, when you buy it in the marketplace, all of a sudden your flesh cannot help but feel a rush of joy over over holding a bounty paper towel of all things or a charm toilet paper. Lost and saved, atheist and Bible believer have that thankfulness and joy of all things. Why? Because the Lord let that happen with COVID-19. If some of those things are taken from us, we'd learn more joy. You know, uh, there, were, there was a one time when these preachers got up and they were from a third world country and their testimony just convicted the audience and melted their hearts. And then one of the American preachers who saw those third world country preachers give a testimony, he gave a prayer to the Lord. He said, Lord, please don't bless them more. Don't give them more. You might say, why? Because the preacher said what those third world country preachers got was special. And the only reason why was because the reason why their joy and their gratitude was really big compared to the Americans was they weren't spoiled with so much goods. So the preacher said, Lord, don't let them experience so much goods. Detachment could be a good thing, perhaps. Amen. Thankfulness and joy, don't let that leave you. Did, that, did you learn that from the coronavirus? Idleness and thoughts was definitely, has definitely increased during this COVID-19 situation. Why? Because you're isolated, you're alone, and that mind runs wild. Where does depression come from? From your thoughts. Where did worry came from? From your thoughts. Why did I fall into sin again? Because of your thoughts. Thought, 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 thought. And the, the best way during this COVID-19 situation was, I hope you learned how to get rid of the idleness. And during my previous sermons, I taught you the importance of that. The danger of isolation, what you need to do is what? Keep yourself occupied. You need to occupy yourself so that the mind doesn't wander. Did you occupy yourself in prayer? Did you occupy yourself in the word? Did you preoccupy yourself with your loved ones, friends, and family members? Did you occupy yourself with any contact?
church. That's why attendance is important. Fellowship is important. You need to preoccupy yourself, make yourself. I mean, if you are so busy and that was your excuse not to read the Bible, why can't you make yourself busy before you yield into something sinful? Couldn't that be a great excuse? Why didn't you uh, fall into sin again? Oh, it's because I was so busy. Wouldn't that be a great excuse? Rather than why didn't you read the Bible? Because I was so busy. Why can't we switch that around? Why didn't you uh, mess up in drinking again? Because I was so busy. Why didn't you mess up in fornication again? Because I was so busy. And actually, that's very true. If you're very busy, you don't have time to occupy yourself with those kind of mess. Those kind of mess only become accessible when you make them accessible. When they're convenient for you and in your hand every single time. Now you have an app for every good and spoiled worldly possession. See that? That's what Americans are, instant gratification. So preoccupy yourself. Another thing that I learned during this coronavirus situation was self-reflection and surrender. I actually went through a, a moment in my life where, uh, thankfully, I didn't get COVID-19. But I was sick, and then I had a lot of work to catch up. So I was praying. Uh, me, I have a habit that if I'm, if I'm sick, that I pray really fervently to the Lord for quick healing because I'm just too busy. <laughs> I got to catch up. So then I was praying to the Lord, and the more that I prayed, what happened? The more I was thinking, the more I made the prayer specific, and the more that I was self-reflecting. That's what prayer does. And when I was doing that more and more, I saw hidden things in myself that I didn't see before. And when I was doing that, I was actually grateful to the Lord. I said, thank you, Lord, for this sickness that you've given to me so that I can find some things about myself, ugly things about myself that should have been surrendered to you. I thought that, you know, you would think that you're right with God, but you'd be surprised that when you're praying to the Lord, Lord, what is it that I was doing wrong? When you start out that way, the Holy Spirit can show you more things. Pray like, Lord, what can I do to improve better for you? You'd be surprised what the Lord will show you, hidden things in your flesh that you never thought before. And that's why one of my... Uh, big hit sermon videos, I think a lot of members got a blessing out of it too, was the Christian warfare of COVID-19. You know what that was? That was a result of my experience, self-reflection prayer, and surrender, surrender. I said, Lord, I, it's painful, but I give it up. Do that, and it will change your life. The last thing I want to say, which has been the theme of this entire sermon, was that this coronavirus was definitely, we know it's all in God's hand, right? Yeah. Even the powers that be or whatever evil that befalls, we got to realize it's all underneath the hand of God, what he allows. So the Lord did this, why? To teach us something. We went through, we went through some interesting things in COVID-19. A lot of you went through some incidents in your life during COVID-19 that a lot of us don't know about. These things our precious lessons, whether it was our defeats or our victories. The Lord showed us something. He's trying to teach you something. And I wonder if you saw it, or are you still in confusion? Or are you still in ignorance that you didn't know? And now is finally the time that you start to think. It's a sermon that now makes you want to think. Think now, think. What is it the Lord's trying to teach you in COVID-19? Three months is not a waste to God. You might say, why am I saying that? Because the Lord deliberately did it that long to teach you something. Do you believe everything's in the hand of God? Nothing's a coincidence? Do you believe everything the Lord did it as a purpose for your life for a specific reason? Now is the time to search for it. What is it? What was he trying you? What was he testing you? Was he trying to show more of the ugly sides that you didn't see before? An appreciation and gratitude that you should be doing? Or something in your life that you should surrender. Or something about your family that you should spend time with. Or with the Lord that you should spend time with. What is it? As we get back to normal, and hopefully that second wave won't happen. But as we get things back to normal, don't let the past months of the stress and the pain that you went through be a complete waste. Use it for something valuable and purposeful that can change your life. What I want is that when we return to church, we see different people. Amen, 
The same old people we might see in appearance, but not spiritually. Every head bow and every eye shut. This is your time to do it. Become a new person. Become a new person in the Lord. Lord, there is something in my life that you're trying to show me and teach me. Re reveal it to me, and I surrender it to you, Father. I surrender it to you. And this is going to be the new Gene Kim today, and not the same old Gene Kim the previous months. I want to see a different Gene Kim at May 31st, 2020, compared to Gene Kim at January 1st, 2020. I want to see a different Gene Kim. Say that to yourself. I want to see a different me. A different me. What will happen to you? What will happen to Christians after the coronavirus? I'll tell you what will happen to the world. It's back to the same old ways. Rejecting God. Being self-centered. Doing things that they want to do. Trying to live in prosperity. Living in the pleasures of sin. Or whatever it is. Even Christians, saved Christians, just thinking about a robotic routine. Just getting back to church, just soul winning, just helping things in the ministry, etc., etc. No, 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 no. It shouldn't be the same old thing. There should be a change. There should be a change. A change that there were some things that I talked to God and I surrendered to Him and I said, Lord, change my life. I also want to say this. I say this quite often during sermons about surrender. There are some things that's so hard to give up and surrender. But this prayer helped me. And I hope and I know it can help you. If it's hard to surrender, if it's hard to be willing, if it's hard to be willing to do it for the Lord, then the question you should ask yourself is, are you willing to be willing? That helped me tremendously. I remember reading that from Dr. Ottman's commentary. Are you willing to be willing? If you, were, if you at least have that, the Lord, you'd be surprised how much he can take you a mile, a hundred miles ahead. I can't be willing, Pastor. It's too hard. Well, are you then willing to be willing? Just that much, willing to be willing. Surrender that to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm willing to be willing. So you got to help my willing part now because I'm not willing. You'd be surprised how much he will help you. And then surrender can naturally come in time as you grow more. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's preaching, um, I was actually very surprised on how much I was able to say some things, and that's only because that you guided me. I pray that what happens to Christians after the coronavirus will not be the same old Laodicea. Let it be Philadelphia, Lord. The whole world is going to hell, and your word says there won't be a worldwide revival. But that doesn't mean there won't be revival amongst the minority, amongst the Bible believers, amongst the individual. Apostasy can grow in greater churches, but it doesn't have to be us. Let our lives change to bring you greater glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, um, so um, we will start 1235. 1235, please take advantage of using the restroom, stretching, breathing outside. Uh, if it turns out, I just want to assure you guys that um, if you need a little longer time to relax, you can spend a little longer time relaxing while I'm doing uh, teaching, okay? If you want it to be longer than 1235, feel free to do it outside or somewhere, okay? And then you can join in eventually. We'd sure appreciate it, though, if you can try to come 1235 if possible. All right, um, gentlemen.